Hi guys, it is Tiny Little Whispers A-S-M-R So, first up, if you do not care for soft spoken videos you can check out the link to my Patreon below This week, I will be covering the exact same case that I am covering today just in a whispered format I also have a new whispered video up on my Patreon as well and that will be covering the case of Oscar Pistorius Next week, I will be filming the YouTube video using a whispered voice and having soft spoken on Patreon so definitely check that out if you are interested Also, before we get into today's case to small fun things but if you are interested in this my husband has started making these really beautiful charcuterie boards um, they are made with a walnut and then a black matte epoxy here in the middle so go check out our Etsy page if you are interested in these uh, he definitely can change up the colors or the type of wood as well So if you're interested, that will be linked down below And also, stay tuned because this week we have a new candle coming to our Etsy shop um, I have a sample of it here But this candle is called Chateau And it has a nice just cozy scent to it it's got a bit of vanilla and sandalwood in here and we really like this scent and this one also has a wooden wick so stay tuned for these on our Etsy shop the charcuterie boards are already up so go check them out if you would like but let's go ahead and we will dive into today's case Today we are discussing the disappearance of Bobby Dunbar Now, please keep in mind that this case occurred in the early 1900s So while there is some information on this case online It obviously happened a long time ago And a lot of information can just be misremembered or misheard so I tried to gather all of the facts for you guys but like I always say I recommend everybody doing their own research into each of these cases just so you can come to your own opinions and your own conclusions so let's dive in Bobby Dunbar was born on May 23rd in the year 1908 Bobby grew up with his parents They were Percy and Leslie Dunbar And he had a younger brother named Alonzo They lived in Opelousas, Louisiana Now, Opelousas is about an hour west of Baton Rouge, Louisiana In the year 1912 when Bobby was just four years old, he went on a fishing trip with his parents to Swayze Lake Swayze Lake is located just about 45 minutes away from the Dunbar's home And they went there and stayed in a cabin with some friends and family Now, I know I said they stayed at Swayze Lake they were in Louisiana, and it is not the typical lake that most of us would picture when we imagine a lake It was instead a very, very swampy area There were lots of trees and just lots of areas where someone could get lost or easily fall into the water If you've ever been to Louisiana, you would completely understand it was just very, very swampy there 
So on August the 23rd, while the family was still on their fishing trip, Bobby somehow ended up disappearing. He had gone off on a walk with his uncle and several other children, including his own brother. While they were on the walk, I believe they either had some form of a cart or something along those lines. Um, so they were just kind of out playing around and having fun. And at one point, Bobby's uncle told Bobby to get out of the way that he was going to run him over. And they were doing and talking about this in more of a joking sense, not serious. And Bobby kind of joked back with his uncle that he was never going to get him and that he was going to be the winner. So they were having fun. However, when they got back to the cabin, there they were going to have a fish fry for lunch. When Leslie noticed that Bobby was nowhere to be seen with a group of children that came back with their uncle. Leslie began to search and call out for Bobby, but she was unable to find him. So at that point, she gathered more of her family members and they all began to look for him. But sadly, Bobby was nowhere to be found. They continued to call out for him, but no answers came to them. At this point, the Dunbars decided to alert the authorities to their missing son. And I'm really thankful that they did alert the authorities fairly quickly. I know back in the days, it was common for people to just really not tell the authorities right away when something had happened. So I'm really glad they were able to do that. However, when the police did come out, and search the area, they were not able to find Bobby themselves either. A massive search began and kind of went underway in the area to see if anyone could find the little boy. The police did find a set of footprints of bare feet leading out of the swampy area where the Dunbars had been staying. These tracks did lead towards a railroad trestle bridge and a few stragglers and locals that were near the bridge claimed that they saw an unknown man had been spotted in the area. Now the police were leaning more towards Bobby possibly having fallen into the swamp or the lake or possibly even having been eaten by an alligator just due to there being so many in the area. But after finding the footprints and the possibility that there was, you know, an unknown man in the area, they also thought that maybe Bobby had possibly wandered off, but then was abducted after he kind of left his family. So despite this lead, of the police finding the footprints, they continued to search the swamp and they truly believed that Bobby was there in the swampy area. Some of the searchers went as far as this. They cut open several alligators in the area, assuming that Bobby had been eaten by one and they wanted to see if they could find his remains inside the alligators, which, I mean, I get the point, but that's, that's a lot, I feel like, but I understand the sentiment there. The police also released dynamite or set off dynamite into the swamp with the hopes that it would blow if there was any remains stuck in a swampy area. It would blow them out so they would float to the surface. However, the thought of there being, you know, dynamite in the lake, I feel like that could really cover up some evidence 
nowadays, obviously, but I just wonder what the thought was behind it. But that was how they searched the lake and the swampy area. The police's search efforts, though, were fruitless, so they tried a few other things. Bobby had been wearing a hat when he disappeared, and they did a test in the water with a similar hat, and it was found that if the hat sunk, it would actually float back up to the surface. And so the police believed that if Bobby had drowned or fallen into the swamp or the lake, that the hat would have floated back up and someone would have been able to spot that fairly easily early on. But I'm not entirely sure, you know, how accurate that was and kind of what their testing process was with the hat back then. So after this, the police began to believe that Bobby had been abducted more and more. Sadly, the Dunbar family just didn't have any answers, and they were very, very upset with this. Fast forward eight months after Bobby had initially gone missing, and the police ended up arresting a man in Mississippi. Now, this man in Mississippi was named William Walters and he had been spotted basically hitting a child, a young boy, who matched Bobby's description out in public in Mississippi. So the police came and kind of checked out the circumstances and found out that the boy was not related or like directly a son of William Walters. And that's where they began to question, was this boy possibly Bobby Dunbar? Because they were approximately the same age, and they looked similar-ish. You know, they had a matching description of their roughly the same size, you know, the same hair color, same eye color, things like that. Now, William Walters was a traveling handyman. He would go from city to city, and he would fix and tune organs and pianos. Like I said, the boy that William was caught hitting matched the description of Bobby, so the police began to question William heavily. William told the police that the boy was not Bobby, but was a boy named Charles Bruce Anderson, and he went by the name Bruce instead of Charles, so I'll try to call him that from here on out. But Bruce had a mother named Julia Anderson, who had granted custody to William just so he could go, basically, on a family trip with the boy. William said that Bruce was technically his nephew. He said that Julia had worked for his family as a field worker and that Bruce was an illegitimate child of his brothers. Several members in town corroborated William's story and agreed saying that the unknown boy was indeed Bruce, and that William had had this boy in Mississippi for way longer than Bobby Dunbar had even been missing. Despite all of this, William was arrested since the boy looked so similar to Bobby, and the police took custody of this unknown child. The police alerted both Percy and Leslie Dunbar to the finding of a boy that looked like Bobby, 
and they asked them to travel to Mississippi to see if they would be able to identify this unknown boy as their son. Now the Dunbar family did travel to Mississippi and here is a good point where the, the news just differs. Some sources claim that the Dunbars immediately recognized the boy as their own long-lost Bobby, while others claim that the Dunbars were unsure and that they were allowed to keep Bobby overnight, and the next day, after bathing him and checking several moles and scars, they were able to claim that he was Bobby. Other accounts say that the boy immediately shouted mother upon seeing Leslie Dunbar walk into the room, while other accounts even go so far to say that the unknown boy did not appear to recognize both Leslie, Percy, or his brother Alonso. It was widely accepted, however, that their younger son Alonso had gone up to the unknown boy and claimed it was Bobby. So while the boy did not recognize Alonso, Alonso seemed to recognize Bobby at least. After the Dunbars concluded that the unknown boy was indeed Bobby, they were just allowed to take him back home. It was like the police trusted the Dunbars, they didn't trust William, and they were just allowed to return to Louisiana with this boy they said was Bobby. Obviously, there wasn't DNA testing back then, but I find it crazy that they were just able to return home with him. So when the Dunbars returned to Opelousas with Bobby, they were greeted with a huge, huge homecoming for Bobby. And the family even ended up buying a bike and a pony for Bobby after he returned back home. Now, while this had happened and Bobby had returned to Louisiana with the Dunbars, Julia Anderson, who if you remember William had claimed was the mother of the boy who was Bruce, she continued to claim that this boy was in fact her own Bruce and was not Bobby. So the police had reached out to her and she was saying that William did indeed have her son, Bruce. The police then asked Julia to travel to Mississippi to make her case. Julia was living in North Carolina at the time, but she traveled to Mississippi to try to identify her son. Now, I'm not sure if the Dunbars had to come back to Mississippi or if um, Julia traveled to Louisiana to identify him. I'm not entirely certain. It wasn't very clear. But Julia met up with the police and there she told her story to the authorities. She said that she was an unmarried woman who did indeed work for William's family. She had allowed William to take her son Bruce on a two-day trip to visit some of his relatives. However, he was not supposed to be gone for months with her son Bruce. And William had been gone for close to a year. So she was very upset with William, but she had not alerted the police about her son's disappearance. She just didn't say anything. Julia was then shown by the police five different boys who were around the same age as Bruce, one of them being Bruce, or the boy that was found with William. 
Julia, however, had not seen her son in 13 months, and she told the authorities she was unsure of which child was actually Bruce and belonged to her. When the unknown child, the Bruce or the Bobby, was brought before Julia, he did not seem to recognize her at all either, so the police just assumed that Julia was not his mother. Now the next day, Julia was allowed to come back and look at the boy in question again. And after looking at various moles and scars, Julia told the police she was certain this boy was indeed Bruce. However, at this point, word had gotten out that she did not identify Bruce on the first try. This, along with the fact that Julia had had three children out of wedlock, made her claims become dismissed by the police at the time. So on one hand, we have Julia who's unsure of if this is her son. He's obviously grown a lot within 13 months. Yet, on the other hand, we have Leslie, who's also unsure if this boy is her son. She hasn't seen him in eight months, but just since Julia had had other children and was unmarried, they trusted the Dunbar family more and allowed the boy to continue living with the Dunbar family with the assumption that this was indeed Bobby. So at the time, Julia's moral character was in question. Obviously, that was a huge deal back then. Obviously now, that's not how people would handle this case, but that's the way things happened back then. Julia at the time was unable to afford to take the case to court so she returned back home to North Carolina. Now, because the police believed that the boy was Bobby Dunbar, William was then set to go to trial for kidnapping the boy who everyone believed was Bobby. Julia, at this point, went to the trial and tried to tell everyone that William was innocent and that the boy was indeed her Bruce. The issue here was William was either going to face a death penalty for kidnapping the boy or be in some form of trouble because he should not have taken either Bruce or Bobby. Several people even attested at William's trial that he had been in the area of Poplarville, Mississippi for quite some time with the child and had been there for several months before Bobby even went missing. Despite all of these claims, however, the court found that the boy was Bobby Dunbar and William was convicted of kidnapping. So Bobby continued to remain in the custody of the Dunbar family and continued to live as Bobby. William eventually was released from jail after serving two years of his sentence because he made an appeal. However, even though, you know, he made the appeal and the courts released him and let him go, the police still did not do any further research into whether the boy that went home with the Dunbars was actually Bobby or Bruce. Bobby grew up a little bit more, and after he'd been living with the Dunbars for a little while, it seemed as though he had began to recollect a few things as he continued to live with them, and he seemed to adjust rather well. He grew up and 
ended up getting married and had four children of his own, and he truly believed that he was Bobby. At one point, it was rumored that he'd asked his father what his father believed, and his father basically told him, I know that I am your father, and that's all that matters. So, whether or not the boy was actually Bruce or Bobby, it was just a really nice thought to think that the Dunbar family was willing to really not question it and raise this boy as their own. Bobby's family claim that he had been told of the kidnapping and the possibility that he had been someone else's son, yet he still continued to truly believe that he was Bobby for his whole entire life. Bobby eventually passed away on March 8th in the year of 1966. Years later, after Bobby passed away, his granddaughter, Margaret Cudwright, began to investigate the disappearance of her own grandfather, Bobby. Now, Margaret's family had a lot of newspaper clippings, and it was just always kind of a story that was told at family functions and gatherings. But Margaret wanted to take it a step further. She knew that DNA testing was available, and since Alonso Dunbar had also had children, she thought, why not test some of the children of Bobby Dunbar versus those of Alonso Dunbar to see if they were related. Margaret conducted a DNA test, and sadly the test showed that Bobby was not actually Bobby at all. He was technically not a Dunbar, as it was found through the DNA that the children of Bobby and the children of Alonso were not related in any way, shape, or form. This caused a lot of frustration within the remaining members of the Dunbar family. They were really frustrated with Margaret for trying to find this out. They felt as though she was just kind of ruining things for them. But, you know, I think it's really a clever thing to, you know, get that testing done. And it was a shock to everybody. They really truly believed that Bobby was Bobby. Now, I've not heard if there's been any DNA testing to see if this could possibly have been Bruce Anderson. There might not be a way to test that now. I'm not sure. I don't know if there were any surviving relatives of Julia Anderson or not, but that is the biggest question. Who was Bobby? Was this actually Bruce or was this another child? I have reason to believe it was Bruce, but this lends into a bigger question. What happened to Bobby all of those years ago? I'm curious to know your answers and your thoughts, so feel free to leave them down in the comments. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day or evening, and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.